Hi, uh, my name is Mike Waterworth and I'm the uh, rigger who worked with John Riley to design and rig the rig.b robot in Maya. Uh, first I'll talk about the rigging brief. Um, this was that the character had to be humanoid. The character had to uh, have the humanoid proportions and uh, the character had to have the ability to be able to load in um, motion capture data um, from uh, motion capture libraries such as Rococo onto the actual character itself. Um, this is the reason we decided to use Human IK, which uh, I've used before inside of Maya and inside of Motion Builder. Before we get into too much detail, uh, I'll quickly explain what's in the actual scene itself. Uh, you've got a couple of groups up here, you've got some sets down here, display layers here. Um, in the groups you've got the uh, geometry and most of this is um, con parent constrained to the relevant bones um, purely because it's a robot so therefore large chunks of it don't actually deform, they just follow the actual transform of the bone itself. Um, there is a skinned uh, section of skin parts um, and these are basically just like kind of rubber connectors and stuff and some rubber and tubes and the um, stretchiness around the neck. Uh, display layers, uh, you've got one for the mesh and one for the bones. Um, if it's on R, which means it's referenced, uh, it means you won't be able to actually select the geometry in the viewport, which is great when you're actually animating and you don't want to select the geometry, you want to select the controllers of the control rig. Um, these are all the bones, and yes, there is a lot of them. Um, if the bones are appearing too big in the viewports, you can kind of scale them all down um, on mass by going to uh, display animation joint size and just whipping that down. Makes the joints easier to kind of see. Um, you've kind of got, uh, I use a color. Uh, color code on the actual bones themselves um, just just for me when I'm actually kind of rigging. Um, this makes it easier for me to be able to work out what uh, an actual type of joint it is uh, rather than just its naming convention. Um, there are, in these groups you're going to see that these contain all these orange joints and they are the core skeleton. These are the only ones that actually get animated by the uh, control rig itself, everything else is dynamically kind of solved uh, and it does this by using aim constraints and look at uh, point constraints and rotation constraints with a few driven keys and probably a few uh, joint limits as well um, just to stop um, joints sort of like intersecting with each other and stuff like that. So um, there's a, another set here which is just the end joints and stuff that exists inside uh, the rig that if I was going to export this into a game engine like Unreal, um, I would uh, delete these so that they don't actually end up cluttering the scene up uh, once I've done the animation. Um, again, they're in a display layer. Um, you've got these little handles here, um, and they're just for me to be able to select the joint and be able to actually um, select that joint easier without, without having to... Um, go in there and actually select it by name and stuff like that. So that's that's what these are, display handles. Uh, okay, the only controller that exists in the scene uh, that you'll see is this root controller and this is only there to allow me to um, put attributes, some attributes on. Uh, you can see that there are these ones here, uh, which are to do with um, extra animations on particular parts, so I can control like the jet coming out um, by just a single attribute that I control lots and lots of bones uh, with one attribute. Um, you've got these extra controllers here, uh, which I might just turn that on. You're going to see like a, a little controller here that's just used to control the little extra flaps on the feet. again. These are override controllers which I'll talk about a bit later on when we've got some animation actually on the character. And um, this one which I'll talk about as well which is a lock rotation limits in human IK. 
I'll talk about that later on as well. Okay. Now we'll talk a little bit about uh, UNIK itself. Um, before we want to start working with UNIK and working with animation of the actual control rig, I'll say that there's a preference that would be useful to kind of change. So if you open your preferences, go to animations, and in the new UNIK curve default, set that to be the independent Euler angle curves, um, like it is normally. Um, this will allow it to, for you to actually create curves on the controllers that you can kind of go in and edit rather than it being like a curve for a quaternion, which is like four curves rather than three, which is used for the Euler. Um, okay. Um, a couple of other things. Um, if you're fed up with the really gaudy colors of the actual robot itself, I would suggest that you can override it with a default material. This will means that it'll just use the uh, Lambert 1 material over everything in the scene. And therefore what you can actually kind of do is go into the actual scene and change the Lambert material to be uh, a different colour. So um, I can set it to be that. And it just makes it a little bit easier to kind of work with rather than it being so gaudy. Okay, now we'll talk about uh, Human IK itself and how to use it. Uh, okay, first thing to do is to kind of go up to this little figure button, press that, and it opens the Human IK tab. Um, this is a definition of um, bones that the Human IK now understands that are being driven. So it knows that the um, lower arm, our bone, is the right forearm bone and so on um, and that kind of goes down into the fingers and down into the toes and stuff as well um, so any this is called characterization um, all the all of those characterized bones exist in this core bone set uh, not that it really matters but it's kind of good to know um, you can tell that it's characterized because it has a character up here and this is the name of it the name of it that exists inside here um, and what this does is it it's, uh, has this definition and you can actually sort of like now start to add something to drive that definition, whether it be another character, whether it be a stance or whether it be a control rig. Um, understanding what a stance point is, is basically every single characterized character stands in a T-pose and that is that stance pose. So it recognizes that. It's very similar to like a bind pose for when you're skinning. Uh, it's stance pose for when it's characterized. Uh, if it's on non, it just basically means that the bones uh, themselves are just not being driven by this character um, and are being driven by what the animation data is inside the timeline. So, uh, to get a control rig onto this character, um, you just go to um, control rig and just click on it. And you'll see that something populates here and something is now appearing inside the actual viewport. If I turn this on, it, sorry, this one, if I do the x-ray mode, you're going to see what those things are. Uh, and these are just the uh, effectors and controllers that I can use to actually drive drive the rig. Um, so I can now start to pose the character um, and I can actually start to add keys to these and they can kind of start to be animated. Um, Human IK is a very powerful tool, um, but it's very unusual to use for animators sometimes. Um, this is a, uh, the way that it's keyed, uh, you can either key the entire character itself, or a limb of a character, or just an individual actual effector itself. Um, I suggest that if you haven't animated with Human IK before, that you go and find some YouTube um, footage and stuff of people animating with it um, or ask people who use Motion Builder because it's exactly the same thing in Motion Builder um, and uh, they can kind of show you any of the, the pitfalls that it kind of has. As I said before, one of the important things 
that you need to do when animating with the control rig is that you need to turn off that property, uh, the attribute that I mentioned before about the joint limits. Um, I'll explain a little bit more of what this property, so this attribute actually does um, when I actually start to put some motion capture data onto the actual character and you'll be able to see that. But if you're animating with the control rig, please make sure that this is turned off. Uh, you kind of see there that when I turned it off, the head kind of moved. Um, this is purely because um, that property is actually um, controlling how much that joint can actually move, which now which then also controls how much the actual controller can move. So if I start to turn the head, get to a point and then goes, okay, I can't go that far, and then it'll snap itself back, um, which makes it very awkward to kind of animate with. If that uh, its controller is off, it's not using those limits, and therefore when you actually kind of move the head and let go of it, it's not trying to snap back into a safe position. It's entirely up to the animator of where, where they want that head to be. And that stops it acting funny. So please remember to turn that off. Also, one of the things that UNIK has is uh, feet contact, feet and hand contact with a floor plane. Um, you can turn this on and off. Um, you can do this by going to the properties, which I've kind of put inside this um, set here go to the attribute editor and you can kind of see here uh, under the floor, floor contact the feet and that's turned um, on if I turn it off by default and now if I kind of go to the controller and then unpin these and then I move the character down the feet will go through the floor if I go back to the attribute editor this turn these back on you can kind of see that the character's feet are now told not to be able to go through the floor so just be aware of that because if you're animating with the floor plane on and you're trying to push the, the character through the floor it can start to give unusual kind of behavior um, while if it's turned off it's you're just animating it in, in the world so to get rid of um, a control rig, um, it's very simple. You just go to um, edit control rig, delete control rig, and it'll delete it from the scene. Um, what I'll do now is I'll load in some motion capture using uh, through a character. Um, I went to um, Rococo Motion Libraries and just downloaded a couple of uh, motion capture data, uh, motion capture files, which are FB, characterized FBX files. Um, so what I mean characterized is they completely understand a T-posed configuration of a human character just as much as this character does and what it does is it compares those two and can get one to drive the other. So I'll just reference it into the scene. Um, okay. and what you see here is a dancing skeleton in the background, maybe if you can kind of see it. There. And we know it's characterized because if I drop this down now, you can see that another character has appeared in the scene. So if I uh, have my robot character uh, selected and I have the source and I set the source to be the new imported character, it's now going to drive the core bones of my character with the imported motion capture data. Okay, um, and this is why, as I was saying, um, this joint limits, um, if I turn this to be on, what it's going to do is limit certain joints so that if I, uh, sorry, like it's off here, but if I turn this to be on, you're going to see that the shoulders get raised up because before the, the actual data of, uh, of the motion capture is dragging the shoulder down too much um, so therefore I'm using joint limits to be able to say don't go down that far and same with the head um, so you can kind of see that it's important that this is kind of on when you kind of bring motion capture data in but then you want to turn it off when you're actually baked it to a control rig now we've got the motion capture data driving our core of our skeleton we want to bake that onto a control rig so if we go to 
um, the UMI K panel. If we go to bake to control rig, and then we want it to be that it's um, all below. Um, it's all keyable. Um, and I think that's probably it for the properties. Um, it'll take a little bit of time to kind of go through. Because um, what it's actually doing now is it's creating a control rig and then the, it's baking the animation keys from the skeleton onto the actual control rig itself. That's kind of how Human IK works. It allows you to bake between the skeleton and the control rig and then animate the control rig and then bake it back to the skeleton. And then you can delete the control rig and then you can bake it back to the control rig if you really wanted to. So um, it's a very unusual way of working, but it's a very powerful way of working. So you can see there, now and stuff, uh, it's got the animation data driving um, the individual um, effectors. So you can see the keys on these. Um, you can see that the character itself is, is not being driven by the other character, but is being driven by the control rig itself. So I can now go to the reference editor, and if I wanted, I could just turn it off, or I can go to it and I can remove it from the actual scene. And the animation now is actually on my control rig. Um, cool. Like I said, you want to go in there, now it's on the control rig, and turn off the joint limits so that it doesn't affect any movement or that I have of the control rig itself if I want to start animating on top of it. Um, if I kind of wanted to add extra animations and stuff to those little bits, I can turn on these little extra controllers. So if I wanted to these to animate out, I could start to animate and keyframe them. Um, and the other one are the override controllers. I'll talk about them now. Um, what these are is um, most of the time the the animation of, of this piece is actually dynamically solved. So if I rotate, uh, let's see, um, pin the legs. So I should be able to just rotate that around. And you can see that that joint is spinning around itself, as in this one. If I turn this controller on to be an override controller, now when I rotate that one around, it's not spinning around because it's it's not being solved dynamically. But it does mean that I can go in and animate this how I want by just animating it. And it's exactly the same with the shoulders up here, where if I wanted to, I could tell it to be override. And then I can actually sort of like tell it to actually animate in that in that axis, and that's me sort of like uh, that's the animator um, being able having the ability now to be able to solve any problems and stuff by actually sort of blending into this and then blending back out if need be. Um, okay. And finally, I'll just talk about um, attributes that can be animated to add additional animation to the actual character itself. Um, so, uh, see here, if I just scrub the, uh, and I can animate this to go up and down, there'll be like flashy lights, uh, or the setup in Unreal to be flashy lights. Um, there's a spine ripple, where John wanted to be able to sort of like kind of uh, ripple something down the spine. Uh, there is a water jet that animates up and down. And there is uh, three jets on the actual character itself, one at the front and one at the back on either side. And these can open up and again open up. Um, it looks like they've got spikes out of them, but if we turn it back to the correct material and stuff, you'll see that it's just a transparent flame. Okay. Yeah. Hope that explains enough. I am um, quite looking forward to see what people produce with this. Hey guys, I'm John Riley. I was the modeler on the Rigby robot. I did the design in the initial model 
uh, with my friend Mike Watworth doing the rig. Uh, I thought I'd show something today uh, about where we can swap models out and make it a little more dynamic and personal on the scene. So I thought I'd give it a quick go. So here I've got is the generic robot, but the difference is I put in a basic three point light in, um, as well as I've taken all the objects and I've deliberately smoothed them. So we get a nice smooth model finish to it really. Uh, the model was built with creased edges. So when you subdivide the model, it will still hold its shape and form. The idea with that was so um, it would be quite low poly for the rigging and could go into Unreal and stuff like that. But if you wanted to render it and make something maybe a little more um, high end VFXy, this would also work for that as well. So today the task I'm gonna do is I've got uh, a secondary head and we're just gonna put a secondary head on the model. And the great way it works is it'll just swap in and uh, take over its place in the rig and everything will work fine. So I've got the model at the minute and I've got some mocap data just thrown on top of the model. Oh, running a bit quick. Uh, playback speed, let's just put this in real time. Otherwise it's just a bit too crazy. Okay, so we've got it run with a nice run cycle running on that and we can see exactly what's going on. And the idea being, I'm taking this mocap data thrown it on and I want to change a few pieces so we'll just stop that go back to our zero and see where the head we got so I'm just going to find where the head's going to sit in the outliner so I'll select the model go to my outliner and I press F and it'll take me exactly to where those parts are so as they say here's one prepared earlier I'm going to import a head model that I already had Okay, import head swap. I'm just going to put it onto my binary file and I'm going to use our exclusive head. This is a head I made a while ago as a concept head sculpt. It's got a bit of kit bashing as well as some modeling that I did at the time for Cave Academy. So I'm just going to take the model and as you can see, it's quite a generic uh, head model that was for another piece and I'm just going to plug it onto the Rigby robot. So, take it. We would just be a case of scaling it in place and putting it where we want for the overall object. I've already done this, so I can just set them to one for myself and set this to zero. And all I've done is placed it in the world where I think the head would be on the robot. Okay, so I'm just going to take this head OBJ and I'm just going to middle click it and I'm going to move it into the subgroup where the other head is. I'm just going to select the head, uh, the lens and the camera from the original head, hide those. And the other thing I'm just going to quickly do is because it's got an initial blue model, uh, blue metal that's a little different i'm just going to go right click select the objects with material and then just apply the material that we're using on the initial robot that i put on it and now this should look like it syncs up a lot more there we go and honestly that's pretty much it so if i go down hit play because it's in the subfolder of our outliner it just runs and swaps in with the model as we have it so we can do lots of different variations and this obviously works for a lot of the other models as well. So that's the new concept head on the robot or we can go back and hide and go with the one that the model originally has. And that should be it. Really looking forward to seeing what people do with this model. Enjoy it, have fun, and it'd be great to see what comes from the future from it. Thanks.